I can take pride in the fact that I've never fallen asleep watching a movie. The closest I've ever gotten to was falling asleep listening to the audio commentary for Fanny and Alexander, and that's because it was late, it was kind of a spur of the moment thing, and it was 300 minutes long. But goddammit, I nearly fell asleep trying to get through playing for keeps, which is barely a hundred minutes long. This film is the epitome of blah entertainment. Gerard Butler plays George, a former professional soccer player who has hit on a string of hard times. Some failed business investments have left him struggling. His divorce with Stacy, played by Jessica Biel, is hard on their son Louis, played by Noah Lomax, and yada yada yada. Through a bit of serendipity, George finds himself coaching his son's little league soccer team, which both brings him close to Lewis and Stacy, whom he still has feelings for, and introduces him to various capital P personalities among the soccer parents. Yeah, it's a romantic comedy, and the completely generic paint-by-numbers kind. Its formula is completely predictable. It simplifies human relationships, removing all genuine complexity and leaving us with a relation loaf, a big brick that appears to be cobbled together by human relationships without any of the actual nutritional value. The comedy is flaccid and safe. The cinematography, the soundtrack, the everything is punched in the clock, worked a shift at Kmart uninteresting. Naturally, it's difficult for me to find anything to talk about. Let's be clear in just how little interest this film has in engaging its audience. Take the soccer team George coaches. There are no characters in this team. There are no cute gimmicky children characters outside of Lewis. There is exactly one time when the kids actually say lines, which are naturally botched seeing as how these kids are nine and not real actors. The film couldn't even be bothered to give us a Sandlot slash Mighty Ducks slash Big Green Band of Disney Channel misfits for Gerard Butler to play against. They're just a mass of blue shirts kicking around a ball. We're never given a reason to care. The soccer team thing is just a device to meet the soccer parents. I suppose a way to describe the soccer parents is that they seem like characters from an R-rated 80s teen comedy, perhaps one of the lesser rip-offs of Fast Times at Ridgemont High, now all grown up and suffering through a midlife crisis. Judy Greer plays a spastic divorcee who's really awkward in social situations except when it comes to sex, and then she's a... You know what, Judy Greer is playing the same character Judy Greer has always played. Catherine Zeta-Jones is a former sports anchor who might be able to get George a job if he sleeps with her a bunch, and yeah, actually this plays out not like you'd expect it to. There's no point where this character threatens to ruin George if he doesn't boink her. George cools it off and there's no consequences to it at all. And then there's a rich married couple played by Dennis Quaid and Uma Thurman, and this is easily the oddest aspect of the film. Quaid's character is so weird and touchy-feely, I never fully understood his motivations in anything, and the way he and Thurman talk about Butler's character, I honestly thought the subplot was going to be that Quaid's character was bisexual, and he and Thurman were going to try and convince George to be part of a three-way. Well, now that would have made the film memorable, don't you think? With some tweaking, this film could have been about the sexual awakenings of the middle-aged bourgeois. Like you go in expecting a light-hearted soccer comedy, then BAM! It's eyes wide shut, bitches! But, you know, we can't take any risks. Of course, all the characters are just things to stretch out the runtime. The actual story of the film, even though it takes up maybe 10% of it, is the relationship between George and his ex-wife and their son. It's pretty typical, all lovey-dovey, I want you back crap. Stacy's getting remarried, and they don't make this new guy who's marrying her into a bad guy, which is nice, but it's because he's barely in the film at all. Mark... I think that's what his name was. He's mostly shot at a distance, through windows, he's such a non-entity. Neither an antagonist for George to defeat, nor a victim when these two idiots fall back into each other's arms. And then there's the stuff with Lewis. The child actor is, well, not very good. Better than all the producer's children that make up the soccer team, for sure, but whatever. And his stuff is pretty manipulative. He says all the right lines to make George feel sad. I'm pretty sure they even looped lines in there. There's one scene where Lewis tells his father not to leave him again, only I'm fairly certain his lips weren't moving. It's typical by the book playing down to the lowest common denominator. Playing for keeps is filler. It's a vapor to fill up a screen at your local multiplex and a paycheck for the gradually falling off the A-list cast. 
This is the kind of film that will be immediately forgotten, rushed out with a bare-bones DVD package in a month, and lost in the Walmart's $5 DVD bin in a year. And it's deserving of that film, Al. Yes, this film did come out back in September, but apparently the studios wanted to see if they could generate some Oscar buzz from it, so they re-released it for, well, just a week it seems, so by the time you see this review, it'll be long gone from theaters. Well, consider this review if you ever consider picking it up on DVD. I missed the film in its original run, so I took this chance and caught up with what I missed. The film is directed by David Ayer. David Ayer only makes one kind of film, law enforcement films. His screen credits include The Fast and the Furious, Training Day, Dark Blue, SWAT, Harsh Times, and Street Kings. Sure, it's a wide variety of law enforcement films with different styles to them, but still, they're just movies about the law trying to catch the bad guys. So guess what End of Watch is about? If you said nuclear penguins having a chess tournament on the moon, that's very specific, and wrong. No, End of Watch is about two Los Angeles beat cops named Brian Taylor and Mike Zavala, played by Jake Gyllenhaal and Michael Pena, respectively. Oh, and that's about it. There's really no story to speak of here. It's just these two guys kind of bumbling around, talking about their personal lives and sexual conquests, and occasionally stumbling into a super powerful and super evil cartel on accident. Yeah, this is far more a character piece than it is an action film, a crime film, or a film with a plot, really. And that's not a bad thing at all. In fact, it's incredibly rare in this day and age. Of course, they couldn't have picked more uninteresting characters to make a piece about. They're not all that smart. They're not really all that good at their jobs. They clown around and break so many rules for no good reason. They're probably the most true-to-life police officers seen on film, though, in that their private lives are boring, they don't take their jobs serious enough, and they occasionally abuse their power. And I suppose that's part of the charm of the film. First off, despite what their characters do in the film, Gyllenhaal and Pina have great on-screen chemistry. They play off each other in a very quick and natural way. You totally buy that these two guys are lifelong friends. And then there's the scale of it all. Taylor and Zavala could not be any less the center of the actual plot. Their entire contribution to the cartel story is that they occasionally get an unrelated call somewhere, discover that it's tied into the cartel in whatever way, and then a character will show up to take over the investigation, this character usually looking and acting like he would be the hero of a more traditional crime film, a, a big gruffy SWAT member or a scruffy private detective. Taylor and Zavala never figure out what's going on. At one point, they entertain the idea of investigating things, but they never follow through with it. The film is essentially following two minor characters from another movie, suddenly given main character status. It's like if they made a Star Wars movie about two ordinary stormtroopers doing their everyday business on the Death Star, and occasionally they run into Han Solo and Chewbacca in the halls and wonder why the hell people are firing at each other. You know, that's all interesting and fairly unique for multiplex fare. It's too bad that the film looks like shit. Fun fact, this film was originally conceived as a found footage film, consisting of footage from those cameras they mount on police cars, security footage, and stuff Taylor's filming with a handheld camera for a college class he's in. I'm torn. On one hand, I want people to find new ways to use found footage and new genres to implement it in besides horror. But on the other hand, I want found footage films to just go away entirely. The gimmick's done. Get over it. But the film doesn't even stick to found footage. It's actually a mix of found footage, scenes that are shot like they're found footage, but there's no character in the scene holding the camera, and scenes that are shot in a more traditional fashion, you know, with like a tripod and film and junk. So End of Watch is a film with all the bad stuff about found footage, like the motion sickness, the inability to tell what's going on, and overall cheapness, without getting any of the good stuff, you know, the guerrilla documentary feel, the altered pacing, the excuse for why we're sitting through such mundane moments in the lives of these characters, what have you. And the fact that it keeps jumping from style to style is jarring. I can remember the first time they stopped doing the found footage stuff, we see a shot of a police car backing up from the view of the trunk, and I found myself thinking, oh shit, Taylor accidentally left his camera on the trunk, it's gonna fall off and break. Is that kind of jarring that takes me out of the film, it's something you should actively try to avoid. They really needed to just pick a style, be it found footage or traditional film, and she should have stuck with it. 
Some of the more minor characters are cartoony and weird. We never really focus on anyone besides Taylor and Zavala, and the glimpses we get of these secondary characters are so not realistic. I mean, the gang members we see are especially hilarious, continuously talking in a string of swear words to the point where you have to wonder if any of them can actually understand what they're saying to each other. It's all, You fuck, homie, this fucking bullshit is fucking bullshit, bullshit, fuck, fuck, you hear me? Fuck, we're gonna fucking kill, we're gonna, yeah, we're gonna fucking kill, we're gonna fucking, yeah, we're gonna fucking, and on and on and on like that. I don't know, maybe it's true to life, I don't know, but it's damn silly. But then a police officer will stare into a camera and give a weird monologue about how Taylor and Zavala will one day get screwed by the department head or something, and, and these characters just don't feel real. But again, that might have been the point. These seem like characters for a film that's happening off screen while Taylor and Zavala are riding around, unaware of their canon fodder status in this off screen movie. Overall, End of Watch is a flawed but worthwhile experience and a pleasant surprise, as I knew nothing about this film going in and wasn't expecting much beyond typical high drama police procedural. A B minus experience if I was into letter grades. See you next week.